Uh, before introducing our head table, uh, let me remind you all of our coming speakers. On Tuesday, October 31st, King Harald V of Norway will present a speech entitled, Norway, a European and Atlantic nation with a global outlook. Then on Tuesday, November 7th, Ben Bradley, Vice President of the Washington Post, will reminisce about his life in journalism, and I'll, I'll bet a nickel that he mentions his autobiography, which is in the bookstores. And on Wednesday, November 8th, uh, Senator Chris Dodd, co-chair of the Democratic National Committee, and Haley Barber, chairman of the Republican National Committee, will put their spin on the results of the November 7 elections. And they'll look ahead to the upcoming presidential campaign. Uh, now, uh, transcripts and video and audio tapes of Press Club luncheons are available by calling 1-800-NPC-2334. And I'm also pleased to announce the publication of a new book, uh, The National Press Club's Best Contemporary Speakers. This book contains 13 of the best speeches made at the club during 1994. And again, you can uh, order a copy by calling 1-800-NPC-2334. And our, I expect our speaker today will uh, make next year's edition because he has a, quite a reputation for uh, lecturing and uh, I, I know we're in for a good time. And if you have questions for the speaker, uh, please write them on the cards you'll find at your table. Pass them up to me and I will ask as many as time permits. Uh, now I'd like to uh, introduce our head table, ask them to stand briefly when their names are called from your right. Uh, Steve Goldberg of Kiplinger's Personal Finance, Mike Close of Editor of Pension and, and Investment Magazine, and uh, Barbara Benham, freelance journalist, Steve Sacklo of the Wall Street Journal, Elizabeth Leslie, Department Editor, Business Week, uh, Fred Fraley, Deputy Editor, Kiplinger's Personal Finance Magazine. I should tell you he was my investment advisor when we both worked at U.S. News and World Report. That's why we're both still working. <laughs> <laughs> George Benjamin, Director, Wall Street Week with Louis Rukeyser. Uh, skipping over our guests, Vanita Anand of Pensions and Investments. Uh, John Davis, Senior Executive Producer of Wall Street Week with Louis uh, Rukeyser. Uh, Chuck Hawkins, Washington Bureau Chief of uh, Bloomberg Business News. Uh, Wallacea Conrad, Senior Writer at uh, uh, Smart Money. Did I get that wrong? Uh, all right. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Hugh Johnson, Chairman, First Albany Asset Management Corporation, uh, Stan Kroc of Business Week, and Stephanie Overman, a freelance journalist who deals in uh, economic and financial issues. <laughs> it's uh, no exaggeration to say that our guest today has brought glamour to the dismal science of economics and finance. Now think about it. How do you take the dull, dry statistics of the gross domestic product, industrial production, retail sales, and the consumer price index, and turn them into a lively television show? Well, if, as the late comedian Fred Allen once said, television is chewing gum for the eyes, Louis Rukeyser has made bubble gum out of economics <laughs> by popularizing the arcane discipline. And he's done it by combining wit with wisdom. Eight years ago this month, the stock market lost more than a fifth of its value in a 508-point plunge. It sent shockwaves around the world. Well, Mr. Rukeyser reassured his public television audience that all was not lost. Quote, he said, it's just your money, not your life. <laughs> Everybody who really loved you a week ago 
still loves you tonight. <laughs> Last December, after the Mexican stock market collapsed, he compared emerging markets to chili peppers. They spice up returns, he said, but can be hard to swallow. <laughs> and this year, after a youthful British trader brought on the collapse of the venerable Baring's investment firm, Mr. Rukeyser noted that there's nothing so dangerous in this world as a 28-year-old with a computer, other people's money, and an attitude. <laughs> Thanks, I'm doing pretty well. I'm <laughs> His wry humor has elevated the pun to a place of honor in the financial world. But he's more than just an entertainer. He's been hailed in the press as one of the most accurate economic forecasters in the country. His books on economics and investing have been bestsellers. Now, Mr. Rukeyser has been practicing his wizardry for quite a long time. His public television show, Wall Street with Louis Rukeyser, has been on the air since 1970. Quite a record in a medium where, longe where longevity is a rarity. Each week, Mr. Rukeyser's program draws by far the largest audience in the history of financial journalism. Millions of television viewers delight in his delivery of economic, financial, and investing, and investing information in a clear, believable, and appealing style. In recent years, he's expanded into an enterprise, launching news and successful editorial products, a monthly newsletter on markets, and a companion publication on mutual funds. A native of Greenwich, Connecticut, Mr. Rukeyser is a 1954 graduate of Princeton. And in addition to his broadcasting activities, he's a most popular columnist, author, and lecturer. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm National Press Club welcome to the man that People Magazine has described as and I quote, the dismal science's only sex symbol. <laughs> May I present the glamorous Louis Rukeyser. I can't wait to hear what I'm going to say. <laughs> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for inviting me back to the National Press Club. As those of you not totally deaf will already have recognized, I'm a bit croaky today. Please forgive that. It may give you the impression that at PBS I've been hanging out too much with Kermit the Frog. The fact is, I'm just getting over a bout of the flu, but I wouldn't have missed the chance to be back with you today for anything. This is a very special group. As those of you with longer memories will recall, I first had the honor of speaking to a National Press Club luncheon way back in 1974. And at least in terms of the tools of journalism, it could have been a century ago. I'm sure most of you were not even born then. <laughs> but let me assure you it was a very different era. Believe it or not, we were still typing words instead of processing them. The only windows we had were for looking through, and the internet sounded like something a hairdresser would use. <laughs> so we've come a long way, baby, at least technically. Happily, I think there are some other positive changes, too. If the National Press Club had been holding a financial writers' conference in 1974, I suspect, it could have been held comfortably in the nearest telephone booth. A decade from now, let us hope, will need RFK Stadium. Now, I want to thank Bud Carmen for his charming introduction. He had a wonderful writer. Uh, 
It was extremely gracious and generous. It was entirely correct. Uh, but I'm a little surprised that Bud, in view of his long reputation for diligence and accuracy and scholarship, omitted my most conspicuous new attainment and possibly the best reason for you to pay any attention to what I may have to say to you today. For the fact is that I have suddenly become a hero to my children, <laughs> and possibly even to some of yours, because of an article that appeared in that distinguished financial publication, Rolling Stone magazine. <laughs> Rolling Stone, it seems, surveyed a number of people in what it considers America's hip community and asked each one of them what their number one favorite can't-miss-it television program was. And Wall Street Week was duly singled out by, I kid you not, Fab Five Freddy, the immensely popular host of Yo! MTV Raps. <laughs> I'm sure it's always number two on your weekly viewing schedule right after Wall Street Week. Fab Five Freddy, it turns out, was entirely on the level. I like it, he said, because it's about money and he's cool. <laughs> well, you can't imagine what that has done for my reputation in the undergraduate set. Some members of which were still under the delusion that there might be something better to do on a Friday night than turn on television, switch to PBS, and watch Wall Street Week, if you can imagine such sophomoric idiocy. And so we're deeply grateful to Fab Five Freddy for knowing what's really cool in America today. And as a further token of our appreciation, the Wall Street Week all rap special will be along shortly. <laughs> We're not talking about rock, we are talking about stock. <laughs> now, let me say quite sincerely how particularly pleased I am to be here today, not only because after a lifetime in journalism, it's always a very special kick to be among colleagues, but for another reason entirely. Because you see, after spending so much of my time this past year among politicians and economists, it's great to be with a group of people whose calculations have to be accurate. <laughs> Some of you people fool around with your own money. It does make a difference. So welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this special edition of what, once again, despite all the scare talk from all the financial gloomsters, somehow did not turn out to be Wall Street wake. Well, what do you know? The poor babies, when will they ever learn? And incidentally, I don't think it's any coincidence that on the very day before the National Press Club arranged to bring us all together here in Washington, both the Dow Jones Industrial Average and the S&P 500 should stage remarkable rebounds and soar to record levels never seen before since the invention of the abacus. Why do I say it's no coincidence? Because I have been here before and I have always known that the people in this organization were the real movers and shakers in American finance and economics. But I must confess that until yesterday, even I had underestimated the full extent of your powers and influence. So keep it up, it was a nice welcome, but we've still got a long way to go. Now, my friends and colleagues, as you know, one of the places where we're all gonna be having a lot of fun over the next month will be Wall Street Week, because it's a very special anniversary time for us. We're having our 25th anniversary program November 17th, and I want to share some of that fun with you today. For as I suspect you may have heard once or twice by now, 1995 does indeed mark Wall Street Week's 25th year on American television, and that makes us kind of happy. I hope it pleases you too, especially the financial writers among you, because everyone who has participated in the enormous growth of financial journalism in the past generation most definitely shares the credit and the pride. Many of you, of course, have not been around the profession for the entire quarter century. But don't let that worry you. I myself was only six years old when the program began. <laughs> and so what I plan to do this afternoon is not make one of my usual speeches on what's ahead for the economy, but instead to take you behind the scenes and reveal a few family secrets about how it all began and why we do what we do each Friday night on PBS. After that, I will, of course, be all yours. So if there's any question on your mind that I haven't answered by then, whether it's about Wall Street Week or the broader political economic scene or the outlook for investing, or perhaps what it's like being called a sex symbol by People Magazine, a filthy job, but some patriot had to do it for America. 
or anything else that you might be curious about, I'll be happy to try and answer anything you want to ask me just as soon as we finish. And I have only one request of you in return for the blanket offer. You ask me anything you want, nothing's ever banned. But I do request that you phrase your question, whatever it may be, with the same degree of awe <laughs> and reverence that I traditionally extend to the guests on Wall Street Week, <laughs> which of course is zero. <laughs> now though, I ask you, as they used to put it in the old Lone Ranger broadcasts, to return with me to the thrilling days of yesteryear. Flashback 25 years, and what do you find? Well, you find that in accordance with every great show business tradition, they did indeed laugh when we sat down to play. They didn't know that the audience was going to find so much to chuckle about itself in the years to come. Because you see, the prevailing attitude at the time was that the subject of economics and finance was simply too dull and or too complicated to attract an audience larger than the capacity of that legendary phone booth. I insisted from the start that while such a conclusion may have been accurate insofar as it described the mental capacities of the typical television executive or Madison Avenue vice president, it was a downright insult to the American public. As I explained at the time, we would in fact be talking about the totally fascinating subject of money, which I've observed over the years is one of the two principal preoccupations of practically everybody I meet. And the only one of the two you can discuss freely during the family hour on television. <laughs> so far as I know, nobody has ever described the other one as dull. Complicated, maybe. <laughs> when the program started on November 20th, 1970, I was the economic editor and commentator for ABC News. And I can say to you with all modesty and humility that I was by far the best economic commentator on American television. Not because of any inherent wonderfulness on my part, but because I also happen to be the only economic commentator on American television. You can't imagine how nice that was, year after year, being first in a field of one. <laughs> Nobody could ever tell me I wasn't doing it right. I had, in fact, invented the job of national economic commentator for ABC in 1968 when I returned to the U.S. after more than a decade as a foreign correspondent all over the world, most recently as Paris correspondent for ABC News and then as chief of the ABC News London Bureau. Many people thought I was crazy for throwing away an otherwise promising career on such a ludicrously unpromising assignment. But my reasoning was simple and I don't think required any special genius. Wherever I went in the world, it was clear that economics was the worst covered subject in American journalism. The typical so-called star of American journalism knew no economics and didn't want to bother with the subject. It interfered with the conventional self-righteous espousing of lofty ideals. And it had the additional defect of requiring the mastery of those uncomfortable things known as facts. <laughs> Never as much fun as just sounding off melodramatically from the high ground of moral certainty. I remember my late colleague, Bill Lawrence, a former president of this club, who was political editor of ABC News when I was the economic editor, happily turning over to me any of the messy questions about economics that we received during our annual correspondence speaking tours, and declaring with his famous gravelly voice, which I can imitate better than ever today, if there's anything I don't know anything about, it's economics. And he wasn't apologizing, by the way. He was bragging. <laughs> what he meant was that he was a high policy guy, concerned with setting inspirational goals for our society. The economists, those grubby technicians, could then come along later and dot the I's and cross the T's. Well, anyone who had looked at American television as recently as, say, last night, would have to conclude that this attitude has not yet entirely vanished from the top ranks of American commercial television. But I do think from the country's standpoint that we have seen considerable change in the past quarter century. The reason is simple. The anti-business, anti-economics crusade of the 1960s duly produced the stagflation of the 1970s when we found out that an ideological assault on business profits 
could indeed be successful, but that the results would not be helpful for workers or consumers either. We found, in short, as we have found again in the 80s and the 90s, that if you don't get the economic straight, nothing else matters. That you can't maim the golden goose and expect to keep on eating lots of eggs. And that takes us to one of the most frequent questions I still get every week, which is, Lou, why do you do that program in Owings Mills, Maryland? The answer relates to the distinctive nature of public television, which is not only quite different from that of commercial television, for which I used to work and still do occasionally, but as I've explained for decades to questioners all over the country who wanted to know what a, a believer in free enterprise like me was doing on public television, fact is public television, perhaps ironically, but always to its immense and fundamental credit, has historically operated what is quite simply the closest thing to an actual free market in American television. Each public television station can produce whatever it wants, and if the quality is there and other stations are receptive, make it a national success. And so, while I was still serving as economic commentator for ABC News, and still as I was for fully five years, the only such commentator on American television, I was approached by a producer named Ann Darlington on behalf of Maryland Public Television, which wanted me to moonlight each Friday for my ABC chores on a little program for which it had gotten a little funding in the little town of Owings Mills, Maryland. It could just as easily have been Boston or New York or Pittsburgh or Washington, or maybe even Las Vegas, in which case we could have called it Wall Street West. In any event, ABC agreed to let me fly down each week and do this little public TV program on the understanding that I would prepare all my Friday commentaries for ABC before I departed. After all, they figured it was only for 30 weeks. They'd probably get some brownie points with the FCC for letting me do it. The program might be a critical success. It was sure to be a popular failure. After all, everybody knew you couldn't get an audience of more than three people for a show about economics maybe one rich widow and two stockbrokers. <laughs> and then, of course, Rukaiser would owe them one. <laughs> you betcha. <laughs> I guess one of the first times I sensed that the American appetite for clear, believable analysis of the economic scene was greater than even I had optimistically thought was the night I made a speech at Georgia College in Milledgeville, Georgia. Returning after the speech to what was then the Hilton Hotel in Macon, Georgia, I stopped by the bar for a nightcap. The only other person in the bar, aside from the bartender, was a Georgia farmer in overalls sipping a beer down at the end of the bar. I sat down, ordered my beer, and he looked up and said to me, How are things in Owens Mills, Maryland? 21117. <laughs> And that's how Topsy started to grow. And that's why once a week I travel from wherever I happen to be to Baltimore Airport and thence to the seething world financial center of Owings Mills, Maryland. <laughs> Incidentally, there are two other facts you might want to know about tiny Owings Mills, which in fact is a suburb just northwest of Baltimore. First, the facilities for Maryland Public Television, which are owned by the state of Maryland, are located there on a central Maryland hilltop they used to be part of a state game farm. In fact, when we first started the program, there was a sign there that said, please don't shoot the animals. <laughs> a sentiment that surely applies to Wall Street and possibly even to Washington as well. <laughs> Second, a few years ago, some ambitious developers put up a fancy new shopping center in Owings Mills. To their happy surprise, the center was filled with unusual speed with top-ranked stores because, as a local magazine reported delightedly, many people in America outside of Maryland somehow had the idea that Owings Mills was already a major financial center. <laughs> and who knows, maybe they were right. <laughs> These days, of course, the notion that you might just possibly attract a few folks to watch a television program about money no longer seems quite as eccentric as it did in 1970. Indeed, one interviewer this past year said to me, Lou, you've given birth to an entire industry. How does that make you feel? And I said, heck, 
I don't even have stretch marks. <laughs> but people do keep asking me why the Wall Street Week is no longer the only program about money on American television, though indeed there have now been literally scores of others. We, ha we still have far and away the biggest audience. I'm not sure I know the answer to that. I think it's a question better asked to the viewers than of those who do it. But I do know that we've always tried to abide by three main rules, which have not yet, I fear, been universally adopted. I'll tell them to you now, and then you'll know all my secrets, and you can go out and do it yourselves for the next 25 years. First, you have to speak English, not jargon. Now, that's a very tough rule for many people, because jargon in this, as in some other fields, can be a pretty good cover-up if you're not entirely sure what you're talking about or if you think that pomposity is an adequate substitute for intelligence and thought. Second, if you speak, if you speak English, there's a danger that people will actually understand what you said. So it's helpful if you actually have some knowledge of what you're talking about. <laughs> Operating, of course, with total integrity and credibility and remembering always that you're there to represent the viewer, not to gild the ego of some fat cat guest. And finally, try to do the program with a bit of flair and without taking yourself too seriously, because nobody in this world, no matter how well-intentioned, wants to turn on a television set at the end of a long, hard week just to be, quote, educated, unquote. If you tell them something useful, that's great. That's fine. That may encourage them to return again and again, week after week. But first of all, you have to bring them into the tent. And no one in journalism should ever apologize for not being boring. The great teachers we all remember were not the ones who put us to sleep in the classroom. Nonetheless, we have in America too often, I think, this foolish idea that things are either serious or fun, never both. Each week, year after year, I still, still happens every week, I'll get letters or hear comments from viewers who will say to me something like this. Lou, I hope this won't offend you, but the reason I never miss Wall Street Week is because I find it the most entertaining half hour on television. And I always reply, I am deeply offended by your comment. <laughs> I, I would much prefer you found it tedious. <laughs> Next month, my friends, as we enter our second quarter century, a normal career in any other business, but at least six generations in television, we're going to keep on trying to make it fresh, understandable, believable, useful, and fun. And I hope you'll be along for the ride at least two or three times every weekend. Thank you all very much. All right, there's several of our questions want to get right to the heart of the matter. Mm -hmm. Will the Dow Jones hit 5,000 by the end of this year? That's a sort of two, double question. You know, it's, what, what is it, October 20th? That's, that means this will only be the 503rd time I've gotten that question this year. But it usually comes much more rudely than that's when it's phrased. It usually goes like this. You always make everybody else say where they think the Dow's going to be. Why don't you ever tell us yourself, you big yellow coward? <laughs> now, the fact is that it, it's, the, it's the only question I don't answer directly, and let me tell you why, so let's, and then I'll get, give you what I think is a more substantial answer. We have as many as 10 million people watching us each week, and we've just been through a very cynical, disillusioning era in America in recent decades. Every one of our major institutions business, labor, government, the church, education. We've had leaders who have turned out to have feet of clay. And you might have, after this disillusioning experience, out of those 10 million people, some who would think that maybe even Lou Rukeyser isn't entirely on the level. You know, maybe seven people, eight people would think that. <laughs> and whatever I said to you, suppose I say to you it's going to be 6,000 by Christmas, forget five. I suppose I say, they're not prepared for the disappointing earnings. There's going to be a backup in interest rates. We'll be down 2,000 points by the end of the year. Which, whichever I said to you, 2,000, 6,000, and you hear both all the time from lots of people who don't know what they're talking about. Some of those six or seven people would think every week, whatever I said, 
You see what he's doing, don't you, Harry? He's just trying to make his dumb prediction come true. So I try and stay away from the short-term prediction game. I don't think it's too valuable just to occupy yourself with that. What's more important in my book is this isn't the top. I don't think we are at the end of the multi-year bull movement in stocks. Will we have a sell-off? Of course we will. It's the easiest prediction in investing. One of these days, we'll have a frightening sell-off in common stocks. It will probably come at the least predicted time. And when it comes, all these perennial pessimists who've been so dead wrong for so long will come out of the woodwork and be all over television and the newspapers telling you, see, I told you so, I knew it all the time. By now, we should know they didn't know it all the time that these people are experts only at bum steers. <laughs> now, I think that this country has restructured in a dramatic way in the last 15 years. I think we have got the inflation problem under historic control, which augurs well for interest rates. I think there are demographic and other factors that are going to send this market not only to 5,000, but well above it by the end of the decade. I'll leave it to others to give you the exact day and time. <laughs> One study found that stocks touted by your guests on your program tend to go up during the week before the show. And afterwards, according to this study, they tend to underperform the averages. What's going on? What's going on is a phony study. Uh, uh, there have been any number of studies done about our program. All but one said that the advice was superbly good on average, that we had the best people in the business giving their best thinking, and that while, like everybody else in this business, they weren't perfect, that the advice had been at least as good, if not better, than that available from any other source that was surveyed. The, stu the alleged study to which this question refers has been repeatedly published over the years by one disgruntled newsletter writer whose own forecasting record is so miserably mediocre that we have never extended him an invitation to be a guest, which apparently deeply disappoints him. And from time to time, he, pu he puts out this kind of information. I have repeatedly asked to see the data on which it was based. He's never shown it. He's dining out on it. He's using it as a promotion tool. He's wrong. Now, the reason I've never talked much about this is perfectly simple. For 25 years, I've tried to make the opposite point, to warn people that nobody bats a 1,000 in this business, that nobody should be your guru that the information you're going to get, while it's the best we can find from the best people in the business, many of whom, I would add, often show up weeks later in the publications that have derided us for this alleged study, recommending the same stocks they recommended to our viewers several weeks earlier. <laughs> Presumably, they become geniuses at that point, as opposed to bums when they appear on our show. Uh, the reality is that we've got the best we can find. They're not perfect. They're as good as it gets. Some, uh, some investment advisors regard your current elves, and, and you all know what the elves are, as a contrary indicator, doing little but sh showing a consensus of uh, the Wall Street view of the market. And they say that the market tends to move in the opposite direction of the elves' consensus. It's a, it's a unique opportunity for me to say something nice about elves. I don't know if I've done much of that in my lifetime. Let me say who the elves are, for those who don't know. The elves is the name I gave many years ago to technical market analysts. Now, for those of you who are unaware of what that means, and if you are so innocent, please be protected in your innocence. It will save you vast amounts of money over the next 10 years. <laughs> but for those who insist on eating at the tree of knowledge, the technical analysts are the ones who take a wiggle on a chart, a swiggle on a graph, a little bit of witch's hair and a piece of eye of newt, put it together with the aid of a software package, and then purport to tell you where General Motors will close a week from next Tuesday. Some people take that kind of stuff seriously. I don't like to argue religion. We, <laughs> we pay obeisance to that school of theology once a week ourselves. We have our very own Elves Index. Ten of the most eminent technical analysts in Wall Street tell us each week where they think the Dow will be in six months. If they think it's going to be more than 100 points higher, we count them as bullish. If they think it's going to be more than 100 points lower, we count them as bearish. If they think it's going to be within 100 points of where it is now, we count them as neutral. We then drop out the neutrals, subtract the bears from the bulls, and the net result 
we present to you, as well as showing you how each of the individuals voted. The theory is, if you believe in these people, that if it's plus five or greater, you're supposed to buy anything offered to you by anyone who purports to be a stockbroker, <laughs> ransom your kids and uh, take a second mortgage on your house and put it all into the stock market. If, on the other hand, it goes to minus five or greater, according to the elves, you are supposed to leave town, enter the Federal Witness Protection Program, and refuse ever to speak to anyone connected with the investment banking industry. Uh, over the years, its record is medium good. It, it really only missed once when it turned too bearish early last year. The uh, guarantee I'll give you, absolute guarantee, this you can count on, is if you take its advice and invest all your money on that basis, I guarantee you that they will occasionally be right. <laughs> Why would any rational investor act on a recommendation heard on your uh, program? By the time it's broadcast, hasn't the market already acted? First of all, the advice I've given for 25 years is not to rush out and act on it. Don't forget that several million other people heard it at the same time you did. Therefore, I don't rush in Monday morning and buy it. We're not a tip show. That's not what we're, what, what we're there for. If you hear something that sounds interesting, check it out. Investigate it. See if it's for you. See if it really works. If you buy it three days or three weeks later, it'll still be a good investment if you're right. And you will have missed that initial rush in. But I would also comment that plenty of rational people have made an awful lot of money out of what they've heard in our program by not rushing in on Monday morning. And in, in many areas of the economy and of finance and of specific stocks and specific stock areas, the advice uh, has presented uh, people with multiple gains over the years so that waiting a few days didn't hurt them and helped a lot. Here in Washington, of course, we're concerned about the federal budget. Uh, do you believe that a budget impasse is likely? And if so, what would the stock market consequences be? To me, one of the phoniest stories that comes out of Washington economically, perennially, is the debt limit story, in which we have this shadow boxing and this game of chicken. And in the end, they say, oh, all right, raise the national debt a little. Uh, I don't think it's a great consequence. I do think, contrary to some of what I've been reading the last 48 hours, that it would be serious to have a default. I don't think we should. I think it should be avoided. I think the consequences would go on, not just immediately, but for years, possibly even decades to come. The faith and credit of the United States government shouldn't be played with. It's very important, not just in, a, uh, in an abstract way, but in terms of the cost of borrowing money here. Now, Having said that, I think they're playing their usual game of chicken, with neither one of them showing any terrific statesmanship. Uh, I commented earlier that I, I used the H.L. Mencken rule in my work on Wall Street Week. Mencken once said that while he uh, never claimed to be a moral par paragon, there was more, one small ethical, ethical point he was very proud of, which was that he had never knowingly said a kind word about any sitting president. Uh, <laughs> And I find I'm usually accused of being on the other side from, from whoever's in power at that moment, and they're usually right. <laughs> but I listened to the President this week con conducting one of his sequential debates with himself about taxes. <laughs> Did I think he was right? Yes and no. <laughs> As for the other side, I. I think that the reporting about the so-called contract with America and the uh, Republican Congress in general has been much too simplistic. Uh, it is not quite the cohesive ideological package that we are told it is, both by admirers and detractors. It's the result of a bunch of pollsters last year finding out what people wanted and what people voted for in that poll is what's in the contract and some very important things that they weren't too keen on right now are not in that contract. So. I find it very easy to be neutral in these squabbles because I learned something as a political reporter in Baltimore in the 1950s. And it seems to me it's something we always ought to keep in mind when we assess these people and try and get, instead of getting too emotional about them. Practically every politician I've ever met has this same physical defect. And if you know this, you'll, you'll view them with more compassion in the future. The first finger of his right hand is about one quarter normal size. 
from having been held wet in the wind for so long. <laughs> I'm more interested in changing the wind than getting too partisan about it. A basic tenet of Republican philosophy is the enactment of a flat tax. How would such a flat tax affect the stock market? Well, I happen to believe for years that the only fair tax is a flat tax because fairness consists of treating everybody alike in every other human activity and probably would in taxation as well. I think uh, some of the proposals f which cover large exemptions for those with lower incomes make it uh, more appealing. I think, I think it would be very helpful for the nation's economy. The stock market, I think, uh, would be helped by it a great deal, but that's not my primary concern. The stock market's doing all right right now, and the economy isn't. So that as an investor, I remain optimistic. As a citizen, I'd like to see a lot more growth in this economy. And I think we could get that if we weren't so overtaxed and overregulated by Washington, D.C. Uh, do you look for interest rates to be rising or falling or staying where they are in 1996? Now, I always answer interest rate questions totally specifically, totally concretely, without any hedging whatsoever, because I know at my worst, I'm not going to be any worse than those who are paid millions of dollars a year to forecast interest rates and then never do. We had one fellow on once who I introduced by saying he was paid $1.9 million last year to forecast interest rates, which he didn't. And, and this fellow, to his eternal credit, looked up to me and said, it's getting harder. <laughs> <laughs> With the caveat that the forecasting record of professional interest rate forecasters is terrible, let me take my own stab at it and give you my best judgment. I think rates are going lower. I, think that the Federal Reserve has, if anything, dragged its feet in lowering rates, that the market is ahead of the Fed, that in fact the Fed was guilty of overkill earlier this year with its last interest rate increase, and whether it comes in November or subsequently, I think we'll see some further easing of short-term rates. In terms of long-term rates, I see a lot of things down the road that suggest that while we may not always have the kind of steep decline we've had in the past 12 months, that the trend is downward. Now, I, I have to say to you that the craziest combination in this city occurred two years ago. The oddest couple in America was Bill Clinton and the bond market, the populist ex-governor of Arkansas and the bond traders in New York and Chicago. I don't know how many bond traders you know personally. That's your own business, and I won't embarrass you by asking. <laughs> but the idea that the bond market was applauding some so-called deficit reduction program was absolutely ludicrous. What the bond market was applauding was its conviction that President Clinton had stopped economic growth dead in its tracks in the first nine months of 1993. It, to do heart surgery on the average bond trader requires an extremely sensitive microscope. Uh, and what you then find is mostly asphalt. Uh, <laughs> These fellows wouldn't care if nobody else in America ever got a job. They would prefer it as long as they kept theirs. Uh, and as we found out early last year, at the first signs that maybe the economy wasn't expiring, that maybe somebody else in America might actually be able to get a job, the bar market panicked and ran in the other direction. And now these supposed geniuses who hated Treasury bonds in November 1994 when they yielded close to eight and a quarter percent love them in October 1995 when they're yielding about six and a quarter percent. And for this, you understand they're paid several million dollars a year. <laughs> Which type of assets do you believe are the best hedges against future inflation? I think common stocks will continue to be the best hedge against future inflation because I don't think the inflation is going to be substantial. The hard asset people, as they like to call themselves, sometimes they're hard-headed, uh, always like to say it's gold. And I am so pleased, you know, I, as I go around the country making speeches, I, I kind of get a sense of what people are interested in. And I've been getting a question lately that I've missed for 15 years. I haven't heard it, which is, yeah, but what about gold? <laughs> now, why do you think I haven't heard it for 15 years? Do you think maybe it's because buying gold in January 1980 was the single dumbest thing you could have done with your money short of actually setting fire to the greenbacks? <laughs> Gold was $875 an ounce in January 1980. 
Now it's had a tremendous rally and it's just way under half that amount. <laughs> uh, well, I think that gold will fluctuate. Some of these days it'll go up a little bit. Uh, but I don't think it's going to have a repeat of the extensive success that it had for really a very brief period in our history. I think that real estate uh, is going to be okay, that uh, well-selected real estate is going to look a little better than some people think a few years from now, but I don't think it's going to be the runaway success it was for two generations when people said, best investment I ever made was my house, don't talk to me about stocks, I want to buy a second house if I can, third if I can, fourth if I can, I'm in real estate, Buster. Uh, <laughs> I think the alternatives are less attractive for the average person, that quality common stocks and sticking with them through the hysterical fluctuations of the marketplace is going to be the best route to wealth. Are the market circuit breakers, which you can define in your answer, working too well? Should they be removed? The circuit breakers are the rules adopted after the crash in 1987 that say that certain forms of trading are suspended after the Dow moves up or down 50 points, and there are some other limits that set off other triggers as well. While my basic bias is toward a totally free market, I think the nuts in Wall Street require certain circuit breakers at this time. Uh, the, the institutional traders who are so powerful in the marketplace th these days have all the faults that they incorrectly ascribe to the individual investor. And we see it repeatedly. We've seen it in the last couple of years again. It's the institutions, not the individuals, who tend to panic every time there's a sell-off. It's the institutions who stampede. It's the institutions who all buy at the same time and all sell at the same time. Heck, they all buy the same stocks at the same time and sell them at the same time. I think that a, uh, an individual who resists that tide can do pretty well. The best thing the individual investor has going for him is the stupidity of these big guys. <laughs> Why is the NASDAQ, which you can again define, uh, so yeasty, so exuberant, and so devoid of blue chips and general respect? Uh, did that question come from the New York Stock Exchange? <laughs> <laughs> the, the NASDAQ, which we used to call the over the counter market, actually, it's only part of the over the counter market. It's the National Association of Securities Dealers Automatic Quotation System. Now, you, now you've learned something that you can forget in five minutes and never feel the loss. Uh, has more volume these days than the New York Stock Exchange does. It contains uh, a number of companies that have a great deal of respect. I'll just mention Intel and Microsoft, for starters, that are pr pretty, pretty good-sized companies, and there's a number of others of, of similar prestige. I think that these uh, Internecine squabbles don't require our attention. The reason it's doing so well is quite simple. It has a very heavy representation of technology stocks. And technology stocks have been the market's single best performing group this year. Therefore, the, the NASDAQ index many days is a proxy for how the tech stocks did that way, well, that day. And of course, as we know, uh, on three different occasions this year, there's been a sell off in technology stocks after which Many people said to me, Lou, are, is technology dead? <laughs> and I would reply to them, is the future dead? <laughs> These stocks will sometimes get ahead of themselves and have to sell off like any other securities, but I think technology has become, as it were, the fuel of the 1990s, that it is central to efforts to increase competitiveness, not just in our country, but all over the world, and that as a group, it has a long life still ahead of it. Speaking of uh, technology stock, uh, a member of the audience uh, wants you to know your opinion of Apple Computer. Will it follow the path of Studebaker and Packard? I don't know how apt that question is, because the first National Press Club lunch I ever attended back in 1959, when Bill Lawrence was presiding, the CEO of Studebaker was there. <laughs> and he, all through his speech, he spoke about lark-sized vehicles. And Lawrence got up afterwards and said, I didn't know it was a generic phrase. <laughs> Apple may be bought. It's uh, being bad-mouthed by just about everybody in the business now. I think it's still got s some good products. Sales of Macs are a little better than the market has recognized right now. But uh, when, when people think there's a bad Apple in the crowd, if you will, there's a tendency to take them over. I think they have a lot of valid products. and. Uh, 
their future, either under their own name or somebody else's, will continue. What do you think of uh, index stock funds? Uh, do they perform as well as, and are they just as safe as those that are managed by professional gurus? Well, they're clearly safer. Uh, <laughs> the embarrassing fact, not much talked about by professional money managers for understandable reasons, is that the average big money manager can't quite keep up to the average. <laughs> In fact, the average mutual fund historically has not done as well as the market index in, in general. Therefore, many people figuring if you can't beat them, join them, buy indexed mutual funds which simply replicate the stocks that are in a major market index, most commonly the S&P 500. And they know then that they'll do about as well as the S&P 500 does each year. They won't do quite as well because there's a turnover factor and other costs uh, of running it, but within a tiny fraction, they'll approximately do whatever the market does. Now, I think that index funds make some sense as part of many people's portfolios, but I don't think you should give up on the fact that a lot of people are beating the market, and some of them do it with fairly good consistency, and including some fairly big names and some fairly big funds. So uh, I think a mix of the two would be useful. This also gets to another th thought of mine, which I can, I'll tell you very quickly. People often say, can I keep up with these masterminds? Well, we know what, what masterminds they are. I always tell people, if you, if you really are bored by the subject, if you can't stand to look at the financial page, if, heaven help you, you don't even want to watch Wall Street Week, if there is such a person, uh, then sure, turn it over to some professional money manager or a mutual fund or whatever. But for most people, I think it's not an either-or question. I think that they should make two piles of what they have to invest. They don't have to be equal piles. The amounts are up to you. One pile give to them, one pile keep for yourself for several reasons. First, you never learn from somebody else's mistakes. It may feed your paranoia, but it won't really help you. Second, sometimes you'll be able to beat them. And when you do, it's not only very good for your pocketbook, it's wonderful for your ego. And third and finally, why should somebody else have all the fun with your money? What in the world is a derivative? And how dangerous do you regard them? A derivative is simply something traded that's based on the value of something else. Now, from that very simple explanation, we can get into convolutions that would keep a team of PhD mathematicians busy for the next century. Some derivatives we're all familiar with, even though we don't think of them as derivatives. Your mortgage is a derivative. An option is a derivative. Futures contracts are derivatives, and some of them get pretty wild. Are they bad or good? It depends on how they're used. It's like saying, is a hatchet bad or good? They can be used very effectively as hedging mechanisms to protect people against dangers to their portfolios, selling puts against stocks that have gone up, using, the, using these other markets as a way of protecting yourself can be a conservative way to manage assets either individually or in the mass. They also can be used in a highly speculative way and in an insanely speculative way. I think instead of asking the federal government to step in, that we ought to ask the CEOs of major investment companies to pay a little more attention to what their 28-year-olds are doing. I think it's their responsibility, not the taxpayers. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now, before we get to our famous final question, I have a couple of gifts for you first. A certificate of appreciation for being with us today. Thank you very much. And secondly, uh, a famous National Press Club mug. You have two choices. You can either drink coffee out of it, or if your predictions go wrong, you can get on the street corner and see what you can do for yourself. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Final question. Now, all of us who watch your show are familiar with your wink at the close of the show. Right? Question. To whom are you winking? Before I answer that question, which is 
terribly important and significant for the future of America. Uh, let me say that a number of people write us with theories about the wink. That when I wink one eye, maybe the left, maybe the right, different people have different theories, it means I think the market's going to go up next week. <laughs> wink the other eye, you think it's going to go down. Anybody who takes that seriously would be a blinking fool. Uh, the answer is quite simple. If you are looking at the television set and I am winking, I am winking at you. <laughs> uh, before we adjourn, I'd like to mention the efforts of Melissa Bender, Pat Nelson, Melanie Abdo Dermot, and uh, Howard Rothman for organizing today's lunch, and we thank you all for coming. Good afternoon. All right, well, we kept it alive. You're terrific, great MC. I wish I had a copy of that introduction. You had that, that's beautiful. Yeah, it's right here. Order a copy by calling 1-800-NPC-2334. And our, I expect our speaker today will uh, make next year's edition because he has a, quite a reputation for uh, lecturing and uh, I, I know we're in for a good time. And if you have questions for the speaker, uh, please write them on the cards you'll find at your table. Pass them up to me and I will ask as many as time permits. Uh, now I'd like to uh, introduce our head table, ask them to stand briefly when their names are called. From your right, uh, Steve Goldberg of Kiplinger's Personal Finance, Mike Close of uh, Editor of Pension and, and Investment Magazine, and uh, Barbara Benham, freelance journalist, Steve Sacklo of the Wall Street Journal, Elizabeth Leslie, Department Editor, Business Week, uh, Fred Fraley, Deputy Editor, Kipling It's Personal Finance Magazine. I should tell you he was my investment advisor when we both worked at U.S. News and World Report. That's why we're both still working. <laughs> <laughs> George Benjamin, Director, Wall Street Week with Louis Rukeyser. Uh, skipping over our guest, Vanita Anand of Pensions and Investments. Uh, John Davis, Senior Executive Producer of Wall Street Week with Louis uh, Rukeyser. Uh, Chuck Hawkins, Washington Bureau Chief of uh, Bloomberg Business News. Rukeyser reassured his public television audience that all was not lost. Quote, he said, it's just your money, not your life. <laughs> Everybody who really loved you a week ago still loves you tonight. <laughs> Last December, after the Mexican stock market collapsed, he compared emerging markets to chili peppers. They spice up returns, he said, but can be hard to swallow. And this year, after a youthful British trader brought on the collapse of the venerable Barings investment firm, Mr. Rukeyser noted that there's nothing so dangerous in this world as a 28-year-old with a computer, other people's money, and an attitude. <laughs> I'm doing pretty well. I'm just nervous, too. You got a good run. <laughs> His wry humor has elevated the pun to a place of honor in the financial world. But he's more than just an entertainer. He's been hailed in the press as one of the most accurate economic forecasters in the country. Uh, before introducing our head table, uh, let me remind you all of our coming speakers. On Tuesday, October 31st, King Harald V of Norway 
will present a speech entitled, Norway, a European and Atlantic nation with a global outlook. Then on Tuesday, November 7th, Ben Bradley, Vice President of the Washington Post, will reminisce about his life in journalism, and I'll, I'll bet a nickel that he mentions his autobiography, which is in the bookstores. And on Wednesday, November 8th, uh, Senator Chris Dodd, co-chair of the Democratic National Committee, and Haley Barber, chairman of the Republican National Committee, will put their spin on the results of the November 7 elections. And they'll look ahead to the upcoming presidential campaign. Uh, now, uh, transcripts and video and audio tapes of press club luncheons are available by calling 1-800-NPC-2334. And I'm also pleased to announce the publication of a new book, uh, The National Press Club's Best Contemporary Speakers. This book contains 13 of the best speeches made at the club during 1994. And again, you can... Uh, books on economics and investing have been bestsellers. Now, Mr. Rukeyser has been practicing his wizardry for quite a long time. His public television show, Wall Street with Louis Rukeyser has been on the air since 1970. Quite a record in a medium where, longe where longevity is a rarity. Each week, Mr. Rukeyser's program draws by far the largest audience in the history of financial journalism. Millions of television viewers delight in his delivery of economic, financial, and investing, and investing information in a clear, believable, and appealing style. In recent years, he's expanded into an enterprise, launching news and successful editorial products, a monthly newsletter on markets, and a companion publication on mutual funds. A native of Greenwich, Connecticut, Mr. Rukeyser is a 1954 graduate of Princeton. And in addition to his broadcasting activities, he's a most popular columnist, author, and lecturer. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm National Press Club welcome to the man that People Magazine has described as, and I quote, uh, Wallacea Conrad, senior writer at uh, uh, Smart Money. Did I get that wrong? Uh, all right. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Hugh Johnson, chairman, First Albany Asset Management Corporation. Uh, Stan Kroc of Business Week. And Stephanie Overman, a freelance journalist who deals in uh, economic and financial issues. <laughs> It's uh, no exaggeration to say that our guest today has brought glamour to the dismal science of economics and finance. Now think about it. How do you take the dull, dry statistics of the gross domestic product, industrial production, retail sales, and the consumer price index and turn them into a lively television show? Well, if, as the late comedian Fred Allen once said, television is chewing gum for the eyes. <laughs> Louis Rukeyser has made bubble gum out of economics <laughs> by popularizing the arcane discipline. And he's done it by combining wit with wisdom. Eight years ago this month, the stock market lost more than a fifth of its value in a, in a 508 point plunge. It sent shockwaves around the world. Well, Mr.